December 1988, Kansas City. Robert Badella finally confessed to kidnapping, raping, torturing, and then killing six men, four and a half years after the murder of his first victim. To him, they weren't living, feeling, breathing individuals. They were literally just pieces of meat, and he would do with them what he wanted. He took hundreds of photos and kept vivid, detailed notes to document his macabre acts, using ever-increasing twisted methods to cause unimaginable pain and suffering. This was not a spree killing. This was not somebody out of control of their actions. This is somebody who knows what he's doing, knows what he wants to do, and does it. That is the definition of evil. After murdering them, he dissected his victims with such precision, he became known as the Kansas City Butcher. And then he would cut the bodies up with a butcher knife and a chainsaw, and then put them in the trash. His dark fantasies, sick mind, and horrific torture of six men that sometimes lasted weeks at a time makes Robert Badella one of the world's most evil killers. April the 2nd, 1988, Kansas City, Missouri. A man wearing nothing but a dog collar was found in the street. He was taken to a house nearby where he pled for police to be called. A police investigation revealed a horrific series of murders that took place at the hands of one man who systematically and methodically kidnapped and tortured young, vulnerable men before killing them. Bordella is evil because he took advantage of the weak and he just performed so many unpleasant acts on them while they were alive. For Bordella, it's more than just killing, it's cruelty. After claiming his first victim in 1984, he went on to murder five more men, each time increasing the level of pain and suffering that he caused them. Badella had a complete disregard for human life, and I think what he was always aiming for was to create this compliant, docile sex slave. And some of his victims, he treated them so brutally that they died as a result of the torture, as a result of him trying to deprive them of all of their sensations. Rick Holtzclaw was the assistant prosecutor for the sex crimes unit in Kansas City he would prey on those who uh, were down and out or needed some help. Um, he would befriend them or take them in, and that's how it would begin. Berdella's crimes would go unnoticed for years until one day one of his victims managed to escape and call for help. Troy Cole was the lead detective on the case. We decided to bring in a backhoe to dig up that one particular spot where it looked like it might have had a grave marker to it. and. Uh, Sure enough, on the second scoop of the backhoe, it pulled up a human head. And that was the first time that I realized we had a homicide investigation, and it was probably going to be a, a big investigation. Until this point, Padella was seen as an upstanding member of the local community. Roy Orth was a sergeant with the Kansas City Police Department. Robert Padella was a member of the arts community in Kansas City, Missouri, a former student of the Kansas City Art Institute. He was involved in his neighborhood crime watch program, and as I remember, was even a court-appointed advocate for uh, juveniles through the Kansas City, Missouri juvenile justice system. This seemingly normal member of the Kansas City community went from being an upstanding citizen to an infamous serial killer. Badella documented the torture and the murder of his victims for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, he wanted to relive and revisit that sense of power he felt when he was doing these things. But secondly, he wanted to create an archive. I think he wanted history to remember him and remember the horrendous things that he'd done. This killer story begins in 1949. 
Robert Andrew Badella Jr. was born on January the 31st, the first of two sons. He was raised in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, in a strict Catholic household. His father worked at the Ford Motor Company. His mother was a homemaker, so they were very much the traditional American nuclear family. Badella was a shy, intelligent child who struggled to fit in at school. He was bullied by his peers because he did stand out as different. He wore very thick glasses. He went to the algebra club. He collected stamps. So there was that sense in which he always felt that isolation from his peer group. Then, in his mid-teens, his world was turned upside down. Badella's father died of a heart attack when he was 16, and this did have quite a significant impact on him because his mother remarried and she went on to set up another home with somebody else. And I think that Badella really did feel a sense of rejection here. He was part of his mother's past. The world had moved on and he was left behind. Around the same time, Badella had been working part-time. There's a particular incident that Badella later recalls that is potentially significant. Badella claims that he was raped when he was an adolescent at a restaurant where he worked. Badella never reported the incident to the police. In 1967, after graduating high school, Badella enrolled in Kansas City Art Institute. At this time, he'd begun exploring his sexuality. He'd realized that he was certainly gay. And it was pretty apparent to him that his father would not have approved of that. He's also been brought up in the Catholic Church, so I think there is very much an underlying sense of shame there. By 1969, Badella had begun to experiment with drugs. He quit college after tutors failed to understand his twisted art projects, often involving live animals. He may have been a bit nerdy to look at, and a bit strange, but he was clearly talented. In need of a job, Badella put his talents to a new use. Badella started working as a short order chef and quickly rose. He developed quite a good reputation in the local community as people were talking about the food that he was making. And he bought his own house. He had quite a bright future. He really was a figure that commanded respect in the local community. By his mid to late 20s, Badella had also developed a passion for collecting, and this hobby soon became a business in its own right. He was obviously a very good chef, but it wasn't his only talent. He also collected art and antiquities. This was a man of quite considerable taste, working at some of the best restaurants, and at the same time operating a boutique called Bob's Bazaar, Bazaar selling art and antiquities. The boutique became Badella's full-time job, and he began to rent out rooms in his home to help make ends meet. Some of those lodgers were vulnerable young men who'd received bed and board in return for carrying out jobs around the house and at his antique shop. People who'd run away from home, young gay men, uh, couples, uh, rather a sort of benevolent figure. As far as the local community concerned, an entirely upright and straightforward citizen. In 1984, Badella's behavior began to get bizarre. His house had become literally a warehouse of all sorts of odd objects. This man, who previously had been sort of pillar of the local community, was becoming increasingly odd. And he also, I think, began to despise the young men who came seeking shelter. In March that year, age 35, Badella began a relationship with a 19-year-old male former sex worker, Jerry Howell. Badella knew his dad, who also had a stall in the flea market. So Jerry hung around with his dad, so Badella knew both of them well. Jerry had had some issues with drugs. He'd had some issues with the criminal justice system. And I think Badella was, was seen to be this trusted figure. So when Badella offers to help him, he offers to lend him money. Jerry takes him up on this. He doesn't pay him back, though. On July the 5th, 1984, he picked Jerry up from the flea market to help with some jobs. But Jerry was more interested in getting loaded. Badella gave him drugs and alcohol, and they headed home. 
but getting increasingly frustrated with Jerry using him, Badella gave Jerry some stronger medication that caused him to pass out. When the victim became virtually unconscious, Badella would inject him with drugs, giving him absolute control over the body. He would then repeatedly rape the victim over a very extended period in this case, 27 hours. When he returned from work, the torturing continued. He's not only sexually assaulted, he is struck with a metal ruler, he's given a cocktail of drugs before he's even killed. So we have a mixture of somebody who's going to be confused by what's going on, they're going to be confused by the drugs they've been given, and then he's being physically and sexually assaulted. It's just a horrific way to die. The following night, Jerry was dead. Bedella had meticulously detailed the torture and murder in extensive notes and photographs. One of the things that Bedella did immediately after Jerry had died was to note down and describe precisely what he did with the body, which effectively was to drain it of blood and then dismember it and wrap it up in garbage bags. He kept a detailed record because in many ways, that was the kind of character that he was. He took pride in his work. He was completely cold and isolated, interested only in his own satisfaction, which makes it all the more chilling. Berdella bagged up the remains with all the instruments he'd used and dumped it in the trash, which was picked up the next morning. On July the 8th, Jerry's father contacted the police. Jerry's father reports him missing, and Badella is interviewed by the police in relation to this. And Badella says, well, I dropped him off at the 7-Eleven, the convenience store. And at this point in time, why wouldn't the police believe Badella? He's this upstanding figure in the community. He's not somebody who would appear to have a reason to lie. So unfortunately, this case goes cold. Then officers received a tip off from one of Badella's previous boarders, Todd. One of Jerry's acquaintances, who was also known to Berdella, actually tipped off the police that they thought that Berdella may have been involved or at least given Jerry a hot shot injection. But there was no body. Nobody knew where Jerry was. Berdella was put under surveillance, but no evidence was ever found. Jerry Howe's father always thought that Berdella had done something to his kid. He just couldn't prove it. And, uh, but, but yes, he was very suspicious of him. Jerry Howell's body was never discovered. Badella had developed a sick taste for torture and murder. And after getting away with his first crime, he began to look for ever-increasing horrific ways to get his sexual kicks. Nine months after he tortured and murdered his first victim, 19-year-old Jerry Howell, Robert Badella took his next victim. So Robert Sheldon was somebody who had stayed with Badella before at his house. So there was a degree of trust in this relationship, and it was trust that Badella really did take advantage of. On April the 10th, 20-year-old drug addict Robert Sheldon appeared at Badella's door looking for somewhere to stay after an argument with his girlfriend. Shortly after he set foot inside, Badella put his sadistic plan into action. He keeps him for four days. Automatically, you know that this is going to be somebody who's in distress. He starts to escalate his cruelty with this victim. He injects drain cleaner into his eyes. He fills his ears with corking material. There's damage to the hands from piano wire. He's hitting him with a rubber mallet. All of these things are acts of cruelty, and they would not kill you. It's subduing the victim. He did some horrendous things to him, but the thing that really stood out for me was the tattoo that he gave this victim on his shoulder. He was almost branding this man, saying, you are mine, I own you and I possess you. Like he had with his first victim, Badella documented his methods by writing intricate notes. This time, he went one step further and included himself in the photographs with his tormented victim. He wanted an absolute record of everything he'd done. It was a certain amount of pride 
there is no doubt whatever that that's what was in his mind. He documented it because he was proud of it. On the 14th of April, Badella arrived home to find a workman he knew on the roof of his property. Concerned that he'd be discovered, he decided to kill Robert. He becomes quite paranoid because he knows this guy. So Badella takes matters into his own hands and he goes and places a plastic bag over the head of his victim, essentially ending his life. Badella began his ritual act of cutting up his victim's body piece by piece. Dismembering a body is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but if you have some knowledge, like a surgeon or a chef, then you can quite effectively dismember a body, and that makes it easier to dispose of. This horrific expertise in chopping up bodies later earned Badella the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. In keeping with his obsession with collecting, this time Badella decided he wanted to keep a souvenir of his actions. Badella's second victim, Robert, he dismembered the body and cut off the head. But this time he didn't put it all into black garbage bags and put it out for the garbage truck. He kept the head first in the freezer in his house and he later buried it in the garden where it decomposed as a kind of trophy of the killing. And this is really significant for me because the head is what gives somebody their identity. It's what makes them a human. I think by keeping the head, Badella wants to be able to say, I'm the one that has depersonalized this individual. I'm the one that's dehumanized them. Badella had now tortured and murdered two people without being caught. The following June, just two months after his last murder, he struck again. Mark was a young man who had helped out around Badella's house. He'd mown the lawn for him a few times, and Badella discovered him intoxicated in his shed one day. He invites him into his home, and so begins the process of torture, as had been the case with previous victims. 20-year-old Mark Wallace was gagged and injected with a cocktail of drugs to sedate him before he was restrained and raped. Mark was Badella's third victim. And again, I think we have with this the escalation and the experimentation. We have injection of drugs. He's used the rubber mallet again to strike his victim. But now he's applying electric shocks. When Badella returned from work that evening, he found Mark trying to free himself. Badella sedated him again before continuing to rape and torture his victim. It's almost as if he has a compliant victim and he's thinking, what will this do? Electric shocks are rarely fatal, but they can be tremendously painful. As had become his custom, Badella kept a record of his barbaric actions in his diary. On the 23rd of June, 1985, he wrote, 7 a.m., no signs of life. He died as a result of the torture. And in previous cases, we've seen this happen before. Once again, Badella lived up to his alter ego of the Kansas City butcher. He's dismembered with a safety razor, a knife and a saw, and then literally left out with the rubbish. With three local men now missing, rumors amongst Kansas City sex workers began to spread. The male sex workers of Kansas City had developed quite a wariness of Robert Badella. He'd developed something of a reputation at this time for being aggressive with people, for wanting to tie them up, wanting to aggressively rape them. So there was definitely a sense in which this guy was somebody to steer clear of. This guy was potentially dangerous. Badella was well known for haunting what you might describe as gay bars, as the gay community. But he was also very well known for wanting to be in complete control. He did not have a good reputation. And many of the people that came into contact with him warned each other in that really quite small community. 
Despite his reputation, some still trusted him. On the 26th of September, 1985, Walter Ferris, a married man and acquaintance of Badella, turned up at his house. Once he set foot inside, his fate was sealed. Walter asked Badella whether he could stay at his house, and I think in this, Badella sees another opportunity. And so begins a process again of torture and of absolutely horrendous pain and discomfort. Badella found new ways to inflict more suffering to his victim. With Badella's fourth victim, we've got another development of the behavior. We've still got electric shocks that he'd used on his previous victim. We've got injection of drugs. We've got sexual assault. And one of the things he uses with this victim is ketamine. Ketamine is a tranquilizer. It is used therapeutically, but it's known that it can cause horrific hallucinations, and it has to be used very carefully in a therapeutic environment. So potentially we're looking at all sorts of horrible hallucinations added to the horrible things that are actually happening to him. It is a horrific set of circumstances that one cannot even really begin to imagine. Yet again, Badella documented each and every step in minute detail. Badella by now was escalating his torture. Extraordinary things were done to these poor men. And yet again, there was an exact record of what he could survive. I suspect part of the reason for that was that Bordello wanted to see how much a human body could take, what it could accept. He wanted to test everything to its limits. He wanted to see how far. How could I, can he take that? Could he take more? In less than 24 hours, Walter was dead. Walter Ferris died at around midnight, the day after he was captured by Robert Badella. Badella disposed of Walter's body in the usual fashion, so he dismembered it in his bathtub and he put the pieces of Walter's body out with the trash. Days after his disappearance, Walter's wife reported him missing to the police. To his wife and mother suspected Badella because the last time that Walter left the house, he said, I'm going over to Berdellas, and he was never seen again. For the second time in approximately 15 months, Berdella was questioned and put under surveillance. But investigators quickly hit a dead end. The missing persons unit did an investigation. They did their best to uh, further the investigation along, but they were just unsuccessful. There was not enough evidence to charge him. They went to his house. They tried to buy drugs undercover from him. There was various things they did to try to, uh, to make a case. They, they were just unsuccessful. In just over a year, Badella had detained, savagely tortured and killed four men. Each murder he committed increased in brutality as his dark imagination seemed to know no limits. Yet he continued the pretense of an upstanding, if eccentric, member of the local community. And police had no reason to link him with the disappearance of his victims. The police had no suitable cause to search the house. So as far as they were concerned, Berdella was simply helping the police with their inquiries. They had no concrete evidence whatever against Berdella at that point. On June the 17th, 1986, Berdella selected his next victim. In the red light district of Kansas City, he picked up 23-year-old casual sex worker and drug addict, Todd Stoops. Bordella's next victim, Todd, had already had contact with him over a number of years. Indeed, it suggested to the police that Bordella might have been guilty of killing his first victim with an injection, which was never proven. Bordella was sexually attracted to Todd, and Todd and his wife had actually spent some time living in Robert Bordella's house in exchange for sexual favours that, that Todd provided to Bordella with his wife's knowledge. So this couple, they were very vulnerable, and Bordella took advantage of that vulnerability. When Todd needs money for drugs, Bordella sees another opportunity here. 
As soon as Todd stepped foot inside, Bedella began his deadly routine. Over a period of two weeks, he subjected him to a ferocious series of attacks. If what happened to Walter was horrific, he manages to outdo himself with Todd. So we have nearly a fortnight of captivity with torture, whipping, sexual assault again, all sorts of horrific physical acts to degrade, to cause pain. But he's also once again organized, he's planning. He thinks injecting Drano into the eyes will blind his victim, which it does, makes it more difficult to escape. He injects it into the voice box to stop him screaming. These are not the acts of a madman. These are planned, deliberate actions of somebody who knows what he's doing and why he's doing it. Bedella took extensive photographs of the torture and the demise of Todd. I think Bedella felt that Todd was a, a significant victim for him. He felt that attraction to him. And it wouldn't surprise me if he'd been at the center of quite a lot of fantasies he'd had about having a sex slave. On July the 1st, 1986, Todd died of septic shock from an infection caused by the injuries he had received. Like his previous victims, Bedella dismembered Todd's body and put his remains to be picked up by trash collectors. On the 23rd of June, 1987, a little less than a year later, the Kansas City butcher saw his next opportunity. Larry Pearson was a sex worker who needed some bail bond money. So Robert Bedella says to him, I will bail you out, I'll give you the money, as long as you come and stay in Ohio for a week with my family. So Larry agrees to do this. And then when they arrive back from this vacation, Bedella takes him captive. Once again, we have escalation of this behavior. We started with cruelty. It's escalating and escalating. We now have a victim kept for six weeks, tortured, sexually assaulted. Despite the constant torture, Larry fought back. Larry didn't know what to do. He, he knew he wanted to survive as best he could, until finally, in what must have been utter despair, Larry bit Bordella's penis during oral sex. The injury to Bordella's penis was so severe, he went to hospital. Bordella calls a taxi, and during the time while he's waiting for the taxi, he kills his victim. When he's dead, Bordella has the sense to try and keep the property cool, to slow down decomposition, to reduce smells produced. Once again, these are all unconscionable acts, but they are planned, they are deliberately undertaken. This is somebody who is in control of what he's doing. When Bordella returned from hospital, he dismembered Larry's body. Bordella was so angry at the injury that had been caused to him that he was determined to take out the maximum punishment and revenge on the man who had the temerity to actually hurt him. It was the first time anyone had tried to hurt him. And so, yet again, he dismembered the body and yet again cut off the head. Only this time he went out into the garden, dug up Robert's head, put Larry's in the same hole, and proceeded to bring Robert's head into the house, clean it up, take the teeth out, put them in two envelopes, and put the skull, which was all that remained at that point, into a closet in the upstairs of his house. Heads are very, very significant for Bedella, and I think the head of Larry is a very important one because this is the guy who has come closest to Bedella's fantasy of having this sex slave. He's the guy who survived for six weeks. He survived the longest, and I think he wants to commemorate that. But Bedella's barbarous nature was far from satisfied. On March the 29th, 1988, he picked up 22-year-old male prostitute Christopher Bryson and took him back to his house. So Christopher Bryson was wandering the streets when Robert Bedella picks him up. 
and he offers him a beer and they, they drive around in his car for a while. But Della then says, well, come back to my house and you can have a beer there. So Christopher agrees and they go back. He was brought home to provide sexual favors for, for Della and was told to go upstairs as soon as they got there. As Bryson mounted the stairs and started walking up, he was struck from behind and rendered unconscious. With his victim sedated and held captive, Badella began his deadly ritual. Once again, he is tortured, he is assaulted, he is given bleach in the eyes, but this time it's swabbed onto the eyeballs rather than injected in. That would probably be even more painful. There are many nerve endings on the globe of the eye which would react very badly to the bleach. Repeatedly electrocuted, raped and injected with a cocktail of sedatives, Christopher remained a submissive captive for four days. But on the morning of April the 2nd, 1988, when Badella had left for work, Christopher managed to set himself free. He finds some matches and he's able to actually burn through the robes that Badella had restrained him with. So he flees the house wearing only a dog collar. He must have been an extraordinary sight, a naked man wearing a dog collar. He runs across the street, meets a meter reader who's going to a house. They knock on the door. The house owner is astonished, opens the door, astonished, won't let Christopher into the house, but does call the police. Roy Orth was a sergeant with the Kansas City Police Department when they received the call. Chris had been severely physically abused uh, and was asking for help. District officers got there, found this was probably going to be some kind of an unlawful restraint uh, abduction situation and called the uh, Sex Crimes Child Abuse Unit and our detective responded. Rick Holtzclaw was the assistant prosecutor for the Sex Crimes Unit in Kansas City. Roy Orth called me and said, we need you. And I said, you don't need me today. Um, and he said, no, I'm telling you, we need you on this one. He may have told me briefly what it was, that we had someone who had escaped naked with a dog collar. It became evident that they were going to need some assistance. So I went to the home on that Saturday afternoon, and we began the investigation, getting search warrants. And that's how it began. In just over a three-year period, Badella had held brutally raped, tortured, and killed six men and got away with it. Unknown to the police, they were about to uncover the shocking crimes committed by a sadistic serial killer, Robert Badella. Troy Cole was the lead detective in charge of the case. I first became aware of him uh, April 2nd, 1988. Um, I was working in the homicide unit. It was a Saturday and uh, was called out in regards to a sodomy. The guy alleged that he had been kidnapped and held captive for a number of days, and I was the duty sergeant, which meant that I handled the homicides, the robbery, and the sex crimes for that particular day. Christopher managed to escape and flag down a passerby. That's what brought us to the residence. The traumatized victim recounted his ordeal and gave police the name and address of his captor, when Badella arrived home that evening, the police were waiting for him. When Berdella drove up to the house, we asked him for identification and he produced it. He said, I live here. And at that point, he was immediately arrested for investigation of sodomy. We brought him downtown. I asked him if he would sign a consent to search the residence so we could further the investigation. He refused. He said that uh, he, he would rather talk to his attorney. So at that point, we booked him into the city jail and prepared to get a search warrant. With Chris's testimony, police were able to obtain a warrant to search Badella's property the same day. When we first went up to kick the door in, we could hear large dogs in the background, so we called animal control out. Immediate reaction was the house was filthy, had a stench, the, the odor was horrible, uh, clutter and dog feces everywhere. It was one of the worst houses I'd ever walked into. 
Using the information that Christopher had given them, officers searched Padella's property for the room where he'd held his victim captive. So our initial thought was to try to find the room to verify his story. So we go upstairs, and after a brief period of time, we found the room that he had described. We found the bed that he had described, and it had restraints tied to the bedpost. So we were pretty sure at this point, his story maybe had some legitimacy to it. There was a device underneath the bed plugged into the wall that was a, it appeared to me to be a, an electric train transformer. And there were jumper cable clips on the ends of it so that he could attach them to different parts of somebody's body and then increase the electrocution level by turning the transformer selector. In searching the rest of the house, officers discovered Badella's most prized collection. We discovered several hundred, probably two to three hundred Polaroid photographs that he had taken. Uh, some of the people in the photographs were in obvious signs of being tortured. Eventually, we were able to find detailed torture notes that Berdella had kept on several people, six in fact, and in reviewing those pictures, Probably the most telling was one of a young man that was hanging suspended upside down from a steel I-beam in what we later learned was the basement of the Berdella home. And this person appeared to be deceased. As the police combed the property, they discovered more and more evidence of Berdella's horrific crimes. A short time later, we found a skull in a closet which appeared to have been probably fairly recent. The officers gathered the evidence. The following day, a pathologist was called in. We had called in a doctor to examine the skull that was in the closet. And he said that in his opinion, that skull probably was less than two years old. And, uh, but it would obviously require further examination. So at that point, we sort of cataloged what we could find in the house. It looked like it might might have some evidentiary value to it. One was a bag of what appeared to be human vertebrae that had, were very clean. Um, obviously, they'd been uh, boiled out, bleached, almost looked like plastic. We also found a skull that was obviously uh, human and hadn't been bleached out yet. The police returned to Badella's home the next day and they left no stone unturned. Berdella kept dogs in the backyard in, a, in an enclosure. And in looking at the backyard, the grass was noticeably greener in a couple of areas, which caused me to think that, you know, possibly there was something else there. So at that point, we decided to bring in a backhoe to dig up that one particular spot where it looked like it might have had a grave marker to it. On the second dig, there was a sucking sound as it dug in and lifted out. I, I stopped the man immediately and looked, and there was a, a human jaw that had been pulled up. And then, of course, we stopped, and eventually we found the full human skull. What it appeared that he was doing was once he would dismember his victims, he collected the skulls and then would clean them by burying them in the backyard. And after they'd been out there for whatever time he felt was necessary, dig them back up and then clean them out, boil and bleach them. When police extended their search to Badella's shop in the bazaar, they found a macabre window display. As you walked up Westport Road, there was a display of human skulls. I think there were two, I can't remember now. And initially, these were so clean that they appeared to be plastic, but it was later determined that they were also Berdella victims. Berdella's obsession with his crimes and brazen behavior were his undoing. But the police still had a mammoth task to overcome. Our biggest challenges early on were identifying all these people that were in the Polaroid photographs. We had no idea when we started the investigation who any of them were. Of the 200, they were not all facial shots. There were some body parts and, and, and people in various stages, but we needed to identify the skull that was found in the closet, and we needed to identify the human head that we dug up in the backyard. So those were our biggest challenges. 
By May 1988, using Badella's photos, detailed notes and dental records, the police identified the two skulls as belonging to his second victim, Robert, and his sixth victim, Larry. On August the 3rd, 1988, at Jackson County Circuit Court, Badella stood before the circuit court judge, Alvin Randall, charged with the first-degree murder of Larry. The state decide that they're going to pursue a prosecution for the murder of Larry first. But before they get very far, Badella actually confesses. He pleads guilty. I think everyone was stunned. Strategically, I think it was a great move on the defense team because at that time kept the state from filing a death penalty charge against him. Everyone was surprised. I think he pled guilty because he was scared of the death penalty. And I think he felt like we were going to go for the death penalty. And at that point, he started working out a deal with his attorney to let's try to cut a deal to save my life. As the prosecution prepared to take Badella to trial for the murder of his second victim, Robert, he made a plea bargain. Part of the guilty plea was that Berdella sat down with his two defense lawyers and then also with Mr. Hall and Mr. Reeder, the prosecutor and the assistant prosecutor from the murder division. And they spent two days under oath on the record, and he would lay out what he did to these victims. From the 13th to the 15th of December, Berdella fully confessed to all six murders. We spent three days with him over in the Jackson County Jail. And he was very matter of fact in describing all of the murders. Basically, he didn't show any remorse. I think he enjoyed reliving and describing what he had done to the victims. I think he got a charge out of it. And uh, it was a pretty compelling three days. Badella is incredibly proud of these murders, of this project, of this extended experiment that he's been conducting. And he really does enjoy reliving this and telling people who appear to want to hear about it. By revealing the true horror of his crimes to the authorities, he avoided the death penalty. On December the 19th, 1988, at Jackson County Circuit Court, Badella was sentenced. Badella receives two life sentences for first-degree murder and four conditional life sentences for second-degree murder. But less than four years later, on October the 8th, 1992, Badella died in Missouri State Penitentiary from a heart attack. He was 43. In just over three years, he meticulously planned, documented, and implemented the brutal rape torture and murder of six men. He then cut up their bodies with such methodical precision, he earned the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. The prolonged torture of his victims and his obsession with his own terrifying deeds would make Robert Bedella one of the world's most evil killers.